Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully, we can make uh, your lives uh, a little bit better at a really crazy time. Um, what we are going to focus on today is maintaining flow, maintaining peak performance, basically in a time of crisis. And before we jump in, because there's a lot of people joining us today who are really familiar with our work, and there are a lot of strangers who are visiting us for the first time, I thought I would just start with a quickie overview of flow so we're all on the same page. When we talk about flow, we're talking about a state of consciousness. You may know it as runner's high or being in the zone. If you play basketball, it's being unconscious. If you're a stand-up comic, it is the forever box. Flow is a scientific term. We'll talk about where it comes from in half a second. It refers, so we all know what the hell I'm talking about, um, scientifically to an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. Those two key components, we feel our best and we perform our best. We'll go into more specifics in a second. But what that really means is flow is those moments of rapt attention and total absorption. You get so focused on the task at hand that everything else just seems to disappear. Action and awareness will start to merge. Your sense of self will vanish. Time will pass strangely. And throughout all aspects of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. And it's worth kind of putting some, some numbers around what we mean by through the roof. We can break down the science of where this comes from later on. If you're familiar with my work, there's lots of footnotes around. Here's the high level. When we move into flow, it impacts a huge swatch of aspects of performance. We see motivation and productivity skyrocket. In studies by McKinsey, it seems to jump 500%. Uh, in studies run by the Department of Defense, soldiers in flow learn 240 to 500% faster than normal. In work we've done, work that's been done a little bit at USC, and work that was also done independently at the University of Sydney, we've seen creativity jump 400 to 700%, and that's creativity and innovation, what could be more critical at this time than creativity and innovation. So that's really important. Learning rates as well, as I mentioned, and you know, a really foundational level, happiness, well-being, overall life satisfaction, meaning they all go through the roof, as do collaboration and cooperation. It's a huge assortment of skills. And I think most importantly at this time, increases in flow. So our ability to feel for one another and care for one another also goes up in flow, uh, as does environmental awareness sort of as a final thing. And this sounds like a really crazy motley assortment, but all the things that get amplified in flow, if you think of evolution kind of shaping the human body to solve the problem of resource scarcity, which is the main driver of evolution, there's two real ways you can attack resource scarcity. You can fight or you can flee over kind of dwindling resources, or you can step up your game, you can explore, you can innovate, you can create new resources. So when we talk about this broad bandwidth of things that flow amplifies, it's really all the skills we need to either fight or flee on one side of the coin or innovate and be creative and explore. So it's those two things, those are, that's the big kind of chunk of what flow tends to amplify. We'll go into way more detail later. But that's a quick overview of what it does. Ecologists talk about flow. When they define flow, they define it by six core characteristics. And I mentioned some of them earlier. So when psychologists know if you're in flow, if you have complete concentration in the present moment, you're totally focused right here, right now, action and awareness will start to merge, second characteristic. We feel a sense of control. This is really great, especially in times of crisis. We feel like we can control the uncontrollable, which is kind of a useful illusion these days, perhaps. Um, we also, the vanishing of self, right, and self-consciousness, and most importantly, your inner critic, that nagging always on defeatist voice in your head, that gets really quiet, that's critical in flow. Also, time disappears. Very, very critical in a time of crisis. If you think about most of your fears, they're past things that could happen, or in this case, they're future things that might happen. Past and future tend to disappear in flow. We live in a what psychologists talk about as the house or a perpetual present. And so a lot of anxiety drops away as that happens. And finally, it's an autotelic experience, which is a fancy way of saying it's an end in itself, meaning once an experience produces flow, we will go out of our way really extremely far to get more of it. 
Now, from a neurobiological perspective, there is a ton of different things that go on in the brain and in the body during flow. We're going to talk about some of them as we go along. But suffice to say here that when neurobiologists, when neuroscientists talk about flow, we are talking about very specific changes in brain function and physiology. And we have a, pre, a growing real picture of what's going on kind of at all levels of the brain and in our, our physiology. Uh, and we are getting closer and closer to the moments I, we think we're going to be able to really kind of measure flow physically. Right now, we measure it using psychological questionnaires. So that's what psychologists and neurobiology mean talk about flow. Now, we'll come back to the idea of why flow is so critical in times of crisis as we move along. But I wanted to pull back and really start with the question of fear and its impact on performance and some of the neurobiological reasons we're all terrified right now. And this is not to deny what is going on in the world. But it is to say, hey, there's a reality, and then you're, there's your emotional reaction to the reality. And they're two different things. And for tons of reasons we're going to hear about as we go along, fear, vigilance, which is that relentless fear when you can't stop focusing on something, which we've all experienced the past couple of weeks, um, is really, really detrimental to performance. We'll talk more about it in a second. But I want to start with where that fear is coming from. And there's a couple of places that are worth breaking down. The first, that from an evolutionary perspective, the human brain evolved in an environment that was local and linear. Local meaning most everything we dealt with was roughly a day's walk away. Linear meaning the rate of change was really, really slow, right? Very little changed across generations. Great, 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 great grandparents' lives were roughly the same as their great, 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 great grandchildren's lives. Right? This is the environment the brain evolved to process. This is what it can deal with. When psychologists talk about it, they say we have a linear bias. Linear progress is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Exponential progress, which is what we're experiencing now, watching the pandemic spread, two becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, becomes 32. The brain cannot process exponential change. This linear bias blocks it. So whenever we encounter something like a pandemic growing, our brain <laughs> literally can't grok it. It doesn't understand it, didn't evolve to do it. It automatically produces feelings of serious uncertainty and fear in and of itself. This is made worse by a second feature of the brain, which is it evolved an era of immediacy. The threats we faced were kind of of the tiger in the bush, get attacked immediately, defend immediately, threats, immediate threats variety. <clears throat> Today, in the modern world in general, and really when dealing with a spreading virus and a pandemic, we are dealing with probabilistic threats. The economy might nosedive, this virus might spread everywhere and overrun the world, et cetera, et cetera. Those are probabilistic threats, they're mites. The problem is the brain evolved to process a threat and then shut back off, right? Because it's really expensive to sustain fear, to sustain vigilance, very neurobiologically expensive. It's hard on the body, it's bad for the body. Fortunately, when we encounter probabilistic dangers, the brain can't shut off until the dangers are gone completely. And as you know, probabilistic dangers are never gone completely. So this is the environment we're currently dealing with across the boards. Um, we have our own personal issues, and then we have issues just processing the scale and the speed of what's going on. And it is massively increasing hypervigilance. The problem with that neurobiologically is that hypervigilance is essentially a ton of cortisol and a ton of norepinephrine. Cortisol, the stress hormone, norepinephrine is essentially the brain's version of adrenaline. And we secrete a lot of them, especially during vigilance, norepinephrine underpins vigilance. So when you can't turn away from the TV and you're watching CNN all day, that's norepinephrine at work. Really three things to know about norepinephrine. You'll hear more about fear later, but three high level things that are worth understanding about it. 
The first is it's all it's it's an interesting chemical because it's anxiety on one end and it's curiosity and excitement on the other. So it's essentially the same chemical. So it's fairly easy actually to shift the chemical one to the other. But what happens when norepinephrine gets into our system at a high level is it makes us much more logical and simple minded. When the brain encounters more kind of more norepinephrine. The extreme example, by the way, is the fight, freeze, or flight syndrome, right? There's a lot of fear. There's a big threat. You get a big hit of norepinephrine, and choices are limited to three. You can fight, you can flee, or you can freeze. Well, that sort of works on a scale with fight or flight on one end, right? Really super limited choices, but the only thing below that is extreme pain when the only option is I can't stop thinking about the pain, to flow and group flow on the other end, which are wow, I'm at peak performance, my choices are wide open, I can go in any direction. And everything sort of exists on that spectrum in between. But the more fear, the more linear, the more local, the fewer choices, the fewer options, it's exactly what you don't want for creativity. If too much fear, by the way, will also block learning. So you're starting to see how it impacts performance in a really deep way. Um, it's also really, really hard on the body. More importantly, when you have chronic norepinephrine in your system for a long period of time, meaning if you can't shut this off, if you can't shut it down, it leads to burnout. It's one of the fastest ways to get to burnout. So all of us are experiencing a lot of economic hardship right now. It's hard all over. This is going to end and there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunity and opportunities are starting to emerge in really neat, cooperative, cool ways. If you are burned out by what is going on now, when it comes time to reboot and really actually go back into the world, you are going to be totally burned out and incapable of actually getting back in the game. So one of the reasons we want to stay in peak performance through a pandemic is so that we are ready to get busy when it ends, A, and B, so we can maximize our, our time right now. And there's a lot of stuff we can do. And that's sort of where I want to turn my attention now. I'm going to walk you through kind of a three-step, four-step, depending on how you look at it, process for sort of maximizing flow and peak performance during a time of pandemic. And so then we're going to open it up and bring other people onto into the conversation and get their ideas as well and start answering your questions. So the first thing I want to talk about is the importance of a media fast. You've got to shut it down. News is scary and there's a lot of it. There's good news to be found. And we can talk about places later where that might be found if you're looking for it. But um, media, I took the path, I took 30 hours off uh, earlier this week from media, from the world, just shut it down, hung out my wife, hung out my dogs, focused on my writing, just so my body could, and my nervous system could have a chance to reset. And so some of the stuff I'm about to talk about, some intervention could actually work. I think if you're not sort of blocking out the world every now and again, there's so much of it coming at us right now. It's scary. It's built that way, right? Like we know um, the media saw if it bleeds, it leads, works because we're bombarded with information. First place that information goes, it's the amygdala. It's our danger detector. It's our threat detector, really not danger, threat detector. And that's why if it bleeds, it leads. So all the media outlets know this and they're using it to their advantage right now for sure um, to catch your eyeballs. So you're getting a ton of bad news. You got to take a fast for it. The second thing, and I've said this over and over, positive psychology has spent a really sort of long time looking at basic peak performance. And I think there are three positive psychology basics, three things that come out of psychology. All of them are foundational to quieting down the nervous system, to turning off this hypervigilant reaction. And normally, we recommend doing one a day in general for kind of foundational peak performance. I think now is the time to double down, do two or three and, the, and, the, and they are obviously gratitude practices, mindfulness practices and exercise. And we'll take them one at a time. I wanna start with gratitude. Some of you guys are familiar, some might not be. A gratitude practice is nothing fancier than I'm gonna spend five minutes writing down 10 things I'm grateful for 
and really trying to feel the gratitude, the somatic address of the gratitude in your body, or positive psychologists often, often recommend writing down three things you're grateful for and turning one into a larger paragraph. Now, why does this matter so much? Well, I mentioned that the brain is bombarded with information. Neuroscientist Manfred Zimmerman has calculated about 11 million bits a second. Some people estimate it, it's what, much bigger than that, but it's a huge ton of information. Most of it can't get through, right? That's way too much for the brain to process. So it's got to sift and sort. It's got to tease apart the critical from the casual, since nothing is more important than survival. First stop is the amygdala, right? The threat detector. But by the time that information is whittled down to consciousness, depending on whose numbers you go by, what we can actually pay attention to is about 2,000 outputs, it's a huge diminishment. So what gets through? Well, two things, the stuff that scares you, right? Because amygdala is the first filter or stuff that is, that are our goals. There's a goal, there's a fear system and there's a goal system. The things I'm afraid of that I want to run away from, the things I'm interested in that I want to run towards, right? Those are the two things that are the biggest filters on the brain. And the problem is normally under normal conditions, the ratio of negative to positive is nine to one. So for every nine bits of fear stuff the brain lets through, you're getting one bit of goal information, right? This is, by the way, why optimism works so well as a, a way to uh, kind of trigger opportunity. When you're optimistic, your brain takes in slightly less fearful information, slightly more positive information. The way creativity works is essentially brain takes some novel information, combine it with all their ideas, we create something startlingly new. So essentially without kind of op optimistic novel information coming in, we don't have the foundations for creativity, we're not noticing opportunity. So if you do a gratitude practice, work out, done out of Berkeley shows us that you can tilt the ratio. You can get it down to six negatives for every one positive that comes down. During a time of crisis, that's really key. I will also say, we are doing some really cool research at USC with Glenn Fox, a neuroscientist there on flow and gratitude. And the early research shows that people with regular gratitude practices tend to have high flow lives. So there's a correlation between the amount of gratitude you have and the amount of flow in your life. So it's a great place to start. I will also say that when you're totally spun out, gratitude feels like weak sauce and can be really frustrating, can make you crazy which is why I think it's useful, but you got to use it with other tools right now. And the second tool is mindfulness, respiration, breathing. Mindfulness is really just a fancy way of saying, hey, I'm minding the mind. I'm paying attention to my brain. Why? Because I'm trying to teach my brain that it is most effective in this world when you are calm and non-reactive. That's the goal of mindfulness. So I think... What you want to know here is if you're not familiar with it, start, we, you can get really good kind of cognitive benefits from mindfulness. You'll hear way more about this later, especially when we bring on Rachel and Sarah, but 11 minutes a day is enough to start producing the cognitive and emotional benefits of mindfulness. I like to do five second inhales, 10 second exhales, six second inhales, seven sec, uh, uh, 12 seconds. So inhale is half as long as my exhale. I'm just focusing on my breath. And when you get that over about seven seconds for your inhale and 14 seconds for the exhale, it starts to really shut down your fight or flight response a lot. It's very hard for the brain to panic. Mostly it's the long exhale. The long exhale activates the parasympathetic, the rest and relax side of our nervous system. And your brain sort of, it's got common sense. It goes, oh, wow, that's a really long exhale. You must not be panicked right now. So I'm going to calm you down because it costs a lot of energy to panic you, right? Like panic is expensive neurobiologically. So long exhale, the brain goes, oh, you must not be panicked because you're breathing deeply. I'm going to calm you down. Really, really, really useful. Other thing I want to talk about, we are up against a respiratory ailment. This is work, I'm referencing work done by kind of one of the kings of, uh, and founders of CrossFit, former Navy SEAL, Brian McKenzie. He did a lot of studies on respiration. He was looking at some of the Wim Hof breathing techniques, breath of fire. And if you're not familiar with either, just Google Wim Hof breathing or breath of fire is the yoga version. It's basically a really strong exhale. I 
uh, try to do at least three minutes of breath of fire breathing in the middle of my meditation. And I do it for two reasons. One, if I'm really spun up and my slow inhale, slower exhale is not working, right? If I do that for about five minutes and I'm just not calming down, breath of fire focuses all your attention to really violent, strong exhale. I do about 150 in a row. It'll change sort of the, uh, gas is content of the bloodstream it'll calm you down as is it'll really take all your focus but here's the cool thing this is work done by brian mckenzie as i mentioned it actually improves cardiovascular function so you can improve cardiovascular function even if you're sick even if you can't kind of get up move around or whatever you can do this and improve cardiovascular function inside of your meditation i always like to say that peak performers are too busy to solve problems one at a time. They're always looking for multi-tool solutions. So this is a fantastic multi-tool solution. And finally, I, you know, Mark Devine created box breathing. I've talked about it a lot. Google box breathing, if you don't know what it is. Box breathing is my favorite. I use it the most and I use it for two reasons. All right, I gotta give it to a quick explanation. When I say box breathing, it's called box breathing because there's four sides to it. Each, you know, five second inhale, say, five second breath hold, Five second exhale, five second breath hold with all the air out of your lungs. Not only is there so much going on in the brain when you're doing that, that there's no time for other thoughts or panic or anything else like that. When you exhale and hold your breath with all the air out of your lungs, it automatically induces a minor fight or flight response and you have to focus through it. So it trains the brain to calm down that response. So those are the peak performance basics. I think everybody should be doing a couple of those a day. I also think the most important second step is to remember your primary flow activity. So what we have learned over, over flow research is that a lot of us have two main flow categories, a primary flow activity. And this is something for me, it's skiing or downhill mountain biking. For a lot of people, it's playing music. It's whatever you did as a kid that brought the biggest smiles to your face and when we're in times of extreme stress, you want to double down primary flow activity. A couple of reasons. As we, if you can calm your nervous system down enough with the peak performance basics, you can sort of set yourself up a little bit for flow and then just reach for your primary flow activity. This could be, you know, doing hip hop cl dance classes alone in your room. If you need R writing, playing music, as I said, skiing. And when I talk about my primary flow activity, it's been snowing here in Nevada. So two days ago, I went outside. I built a two foot jump in my backyard and I practiced nose butter threes, a ski trick in my backyard. I'm 53 years old. It's ridiculous, but it's my primary flow activity. And it worked, right? And the reason this matters when we move into flow, a couple of critical things. First of all, stress hormones get flushed out of your system. It resets the nervous system to zero. Second thing, all the neurochemicals that underpin flow, they boost the immune system. So it's got really good health and resilience impacts. And if we're in a time of pandemic, you want to boost resilience and lower stress as much as you can. Um, forget the peak performance aspects. This is just foundational health stuff that is useful. So double down on your primary flow activities right now, any way you can. And the last thing I want to say is, You'll hear a lot more about this as we go along. Flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. Flow is a state of complete concentration focused in the present moment. That is your first flow trigger, the most important one, complete concentration. The research shows that if you want to maximize flow in your life, start your day with your most important task, the one that like if you completed it, it'd be the biggest win for the day and spend 90 to 120 minutes on it. Now, when we tell people this, we still, everybody involved in the Flow Research Collective believe this is the single most important thing you can do for flow. Practice distraction management. We're going to talk more about that later. We've got some tools for you for distraction management that are available. We'll get there later. Um, but most importantly, 90 to 120 minutes. Most people say, I don't have that kind of time. Well, guess what you do now? And the cool thing about introduce Connor's going to talk a lot about habit formation in a time of, of crisis and how it's easier to form habits in a time of crisis, but you can test out, run the experiment. Don't take my word for it. 920 minutes. You've got the time. Here's my suggestion. 
take a media fast. Try to end your media if you can. Cut it off before the end of the previous day. Practice some kind of distraction management. Turn everything off that's going to bug you in the morning. Then start your day with 99 and 20 minutes. Run this experiment in your life during this period. What you're going to start to realize is a simple, <laughs> simple, simple hack is that you're going to get so much more work done and fall into flow so much more quickly with this block of uninterrupted concentration that you're going to see the advantage. And when the world kicks back in and you're going back to work, you're going to have proof for why you should start to switch your schedule. And that's what a lot, I think a lot of people are looking for with some of these flow hacks. So run that experiment. So the peak performance basics, I think you've got to double down gratitude, mindfulness, exercise is the last one. I didn't talk about that. It's obvious. And by the way, let me put some numbers around this. Five minutes of gratitude, 11 to 20 minutes of mindfulness, exercise 20 to 40 minutes. And what you're really looking for is till it gets quiet upstairs. That quietness, for those of you who speak flow science, is exercise-induced transient hypofrontality. It's the front end of a flow state. It signals the stress hormones are flowing out of your system, and it's definitely what you're looking for it to lower anxiety and kind of prepare yourself for more flow. Double down your primary flow activities any way you can, and finally start your day with 9 and 120 minutes of uninterrupted concentration on your hardest task. That's the absolute most critical thing. So that is my opening spiel. I'm gonna be here for the next hour, hour and a half. I've invited my coaches, other people. We have this platform for a bunch of hours. If you wanna stick with us for longer than the 90 minutes, you are more than welcome to. Some of us are gonna hang around and keep asking questions and keep the dialogue going because we know it's a tough time. So I'm gonna shut up for a little bit kick things back to Rian and we'll pass it along to other people. I'll talk to you as we go along. Thanks for that, Stephen. So let's answer a quick couple of questions before throwing it to Michael. Uh, I'm just pulling up some here. We got some good ones. Uh, hold on one sec. And Michael and Connor, feel free to jump in on the answers to these. Okay, so we got one. This is the most upvoted. The present pandemic is necessitating avoidance of gathering to mitigate the spread of the virus, which runs the risk of intensifying social disconnect and collective thinking. But could this be an opportunity to cultivate flow and compassion? How do we cultivate connectedness during these times? Who wants to have a stab at that? <laughs> Connor, you go ahead, because I don't want to yeah, follow Connor's getting William Steven. <laughs> <laughs> I'm throwing you on screen, Connor. <laughs> yeah, so first, let me go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Connor Murphy. Um, I'm the Chief Science Officer at Flow Research Collective. Uh, so I'm the nerd that runs a lot of our research. Um, uh, to that specific question, I think one of the things that's been so interesting about this whole situation is first, everybody knows about it. We're all in it together. And one of the main tenets of group flow, right, when you get into group, uh, flow with a group of people um, is common knowledge, right? A common vocabulary, common experience. Um, and so I think that makes this type of situation actually pretty conducive to forming um, some pretty close connections with other people. Um, there's something about it that humanizes us. Um, and it becomes a very interesting jumping off point um, for some pretty deep uh, conversations uh, because, you know, we're all dealing with at some level, I, I hate to use the term uh, existential threat because I think that's a little bit hyperbolic, um, but, you know, th there is a serious crisis on hand. Um, and so that level of uh, common shared experience, I think, can be a very good opportunity and very good jumping off point um, for um, deepening uh, social connection, even if we're physically a little bit more distant from one another. Connor, can I Super. take it back off you, Rian? Absolutely. Hey, go for it, Michael. Yeah. And, and Michael, just, give, us just, full, give us a full introduction. Michael, intro, yeah, well. intro, 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 everybody. The full impressive bio. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I have my PhD in neuroscience. Um, I have a master's in philosophy, so I also teach philosophy and critical thinking um, and ethics. And um, I'm a peak performance coach at the Flow Research Collective. Very simple. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I just wanted to, that's a great point. And it reminded me of this, um, I, I've seen this meme, and Stephen, you talked about evolution. So um, talking about co collectiveness versus individuality and how I'm just so fascinated that 
uh, this coronavirus shows of shows the interconnectedness of of everything. It's just phenomenal. It's it really truly is a small world. And uh, you've seen that meme of the human person with the the ego and the pyramid and all the other life forms, right? And then you, you you've seen the other one where it says eco and the human is just one life form among many. I think that having that mind shift is, is very important. And it's good. And I just wanted to highlight, to piggyback off that, something that Stephen said earlier about the brain doesn't think probabilistically. And I think that's because that's one of our cognitive biases. And I think that's really why critical thinking and having a scientific attitude, which brings me optimism, is very important now to not allow us to succumb to things like the Dunning-Kruger effect. If uh, well, let me actually define critical thinking first. Yeah. So critical. Why do you people, define the Dunning Kruger effect? Also. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll define. I'll define both and why they're so important because they actually come into play, um, and 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 their science is is itself a vaccine against our own cognitive biases, and so critical thinking is um, a set of skills and strategies and an attitude about how to make reasonable decisions about what to believe and what to do. It's the art and science, if you will, of evaluating your own thinking. It's thinking about thinking. And that's the sort of the metacognitive aspect of thinking. Aristotle has this great quote, which I often quote to my students, uh, the true mark of an educated mind is to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And so thinking about thinking, and so the Dunning-Kruger effect is people lack the metacogn... Uh, sometimes people lack the metacognitive skills to realize how skilled or not they are at something else. So I think Charles, I, there's a couple of people who have some quotes on it. Charles, I think Bukowski said, the, the problem with the world is that stupid people are so full of certainty and intelligent people are so full of doubts. And that is the essentially the, the psychological Dunning-Kruger effect. And it helps critical thinking and having this, this scientific attitude, if you will. Um, for example, one of the um, intellectual virtues that we teach in critical thinking is intellectual humility realizing that some of our beliefs are false. Um, and that's a skill, right, that you need to learn. And, and, and again, you need to cultivate. And so it fights against these cognitive biases, like the brain not being able to think exponentially or probabilistically. And that's to highlight on that point, the linear versus nonlinear, right? So exponential thinking is a nonlinear process. Linear basically means, you know, the, the input is directly proportional to the output. And that's the way we our brains evolve, as Stephen so correctly said. So um, learning and having this scientific attitude and this scientific mindset for me is very optimistic. Science is on this, right? Um, and it also helps to think clearly about what's going on in the world and, and how to differentiate, for example, between alternative facts and real facts. Michael, I'm curious, do you have any fairly practical means of sharpening critical thinking skills you can recommend to people? Um, yeah, so it, two things. One is, uh, first of all, it's it's like learning chess, for example. There are rules. There are, there are rules to thinking clearly. So everybody thinks, right? But thinking is a skill. And some people think better than others. Some people think worse than others. It's, it's, it's very much like, you know, playing a guitar or playing chess or anything like that. There's a, a skill a skill set. So it's something that really actually needs to be learned and again, cultivated. We're not actually born um, being able to think critically. We're actually born quite the opposite, pretty much gullible, which actually helps for evolutionary reasons, right? Um, but I, I would say get a, get a simple book or, or a basic introductory textbook. Um, there was a great book that came out recently, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. <laughs> um, which was a, a wonderful book. There's, there's another book, actually, not to, to use that kind of language, but the title of the book is called Bullshit. Um, and it's an excellent <laughs> book on, on, you know, learning some introductory critical thinking skills. The other thing is to start to have this, this, this qualitative shift in your mind, your attitude, right? We need to come at the world like a scientist does, to question it, to be, have cold, open eyes. And if we, if we come to the world and we find out you know, it's like our own, it's like we, what we want and what we desire, that's great. But if not, we also have to learn to accept that. And so it's developing this sort of um, attitude, uh, if you will, these intellectual virtues that, that help cultivate that mindset. And um, again, it, it's, just a, it's just a really a skill set that needs to be learned. Super, super, super helpful. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Um, Connor, are you going to jump in? 
Connor's sure. going to walk us through how stress impacts decision making. Perfect. Yeah. And then, uh, just sorry, Connor. Just, as as Connor's walking through this, folks, please blast the chat with all your questions, and then we're going to dive more so into questions just straight after Connor. So keep uh, keep doing that. And the recording or the the broadcast is going to be recorded, and you will all get access. That's the most upvoted question. So that's a yes on that one. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to take the floor. Um, yeah. So in approaching this whole um, scenario that we're all collectively in, one thing that I was thinking a lot about is how best to find a middle ground between extremism on the one hand or alarmism on the one hand and opportunism on the other hand. Um, and so I think the, the most effective strategy for me personally is somewhere in the middle between those two extremes. Um, and so um, one thing that I want to talk about is, you know, first kind of starting off with why we decided to have this conversation, who we are as an organization and who we're not as an organization, and then going into, you know, what's different um, now that we have the scenario going on and what's no longer and what's not different. Um, and I want to make that as practical as possible and especially drill down into habit formation, uh, because as Stephen mentioned earlier, um, anytime there's some sort of substantial change that goes on in our life, we are significantly more um, uh, susceptible to habit formation. Um, and so that's a double-edged sword. You can either use that for good or you can use that to compromise some of the habits that you've already built. Um, and so um, I just want to draw some attention to that. Um, but first, starting out with who we are as an organization um, and who we're not. Um, and so when we're having this conversation, we want to be very clear that um, you know, even though we work with a number of different people for hell of it, uh, you'll hear from some of them in a moment. Um, uh, we wanted to not be the voice of medical advice. We wanted to not be the voice of financial advice either. Um, but we want to be very clear that we're best in fucking class at operationalizing positive psychology. And so that's one of the reasons why we want to hop on this call um, is because, you know, collectively we're all dealing with a tremendous amount of stress. And I think to a, to a certain extent, it's a transition from um, people in a boom time um, where uh, we're, op uh, we're optimizing for peak performance, and then all of a sudden we're dealing with something that's pretty challenging. Um, and at least subjectively, um, it can bring us down a couple layers on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Where all of a sudden we feel a sense that our psychological needs are no longer supported. And so that's the reason why we want to hop on this uh, call and very clearly delineate that, you know, for, you know, medical resources, you know, that should come from um, likely the CDC. Um, and if you want financial resources, you can, you can pick your choice. Uh, but we want to be very clear that, you know, we're best in class of positive psychology. So we wanted to be able to, you know, offer that as much as possible to you guys. Um, so in terms of what doesn't change in this time, um, I mean, maintaining the same habits, um, using this as a growth opportunity. I mean, there's a uniquely um, human art of focusing on what you can control um, and um, diverting your focus from what you can't control. Um, and so that's what doesn't change through all of this. But what does change through all of this um, is that um, you're going to be under a lot more stress. Um, and so that changes our decision making. And there's a number of different ways that you can quantify it. Um, one very concrete way of quantifying that is something called temporal discounting. And so temporal discounting is if I offer you, say, $5 tomorrow or $10 the day after, um, which would you rather choose? And so when you quantify temporal discounting, you give people two different offers on a different time frame, and you get a sense of what um, they would take um, uh, currently versus what they would take um, in, a, in the more distant future. And so uh, you can sit there and you can quantify, hey, when you are cortisol heavy or norepinephrine heavy, um, it is going to alter your decision making. It's going to alter your temporal discounting. And so a lot of your decision making is going to be somewhat compromised because of this. And so I like to think of myself as having lost, you know, at least 20 IQ points through this whole process. Um, and there, you know, I didn't have very many to begin with. And so this is not a good scenario for me. Um, but regardless, you know, like you like you, you have to think that your cognition is, um, is largely it is to a certain extent compromised through this process. Um, and so um, because of this, one of the main things that change, uh, changes is an increased need for social support and psychological safety. And because you often interpret your financial situation, your economic situation as psychological safety, as something that's 
uh, absolutely foundational to you, you are going to be under a higher degree of stress. Um, and so just being very cognizant of that fact, very aware of that fact, and making sure that you have the uh, psychological social safety nets to be able to support you through that process is you know, probably takeaway number one. Um, in addition to that, um, there's a lot of research on the social contagion of emotion. Um, and so one of the reasons why I wanted to clearly delineate, hey, we're not here to give health advice and we're not here to give financial advice um, is because um, some of the things that I've witnessed over the last couple of days are a little bit uh, shocking. Um, and so, for instance, a couple of days ago, I was in the grocery store. Uh, some random woman um, was uh, incredibly concerned and said that she had heard on a very good source that they were uh, closing all grocery stores throughout the Bay Area. Um, and I, I was thinking more about that. And I, I've been thinking a lot about that interaction over the course of the past couple of days and how recklessly irresponsible that is. Because what the research shows is that emotions operate just like any other contagion. Um, and um, this is true on social media as well. And so it's, uh, there's um, a research, uh, there's a study that came out recently showing how easy it is to spread emotions through uh, social media, let alone these in-person conversations, let alone when everybody's already in a psychologically compromised state. Um, and so I want to be very clear about, you know, um, you know, just drilling down on, you know, what resources are appropriate to take information from um, and, you know, how problematic it can be um, to uh, spread information that is, you know, otherwise uh, just uh, pretty inappropriate. Can I jump in for a second there, Connor? Please, absolutely. One thing I want to I want to add um, that has been uh, that we've been doing uh, 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 at the at the Flores Collective, and I've been doing with, with with other people is when we start our conversations, we agree to not talk about the unnamed thing, <laughs> and we, right, like it's it, it's done up front. We're not, and unless there's something, in me, I always say if you can't solve the problem, it's probably not your problem. That's as a general rule, not maybe not applicable here, but I think uh, we should if if it's not an immediate thing that you're trying to solve in the conversation you're having, you may want to resist that for a number of reasons that Connor talked about. But also, um, we recently uh, completed the first round of a study on uh, CBD and flow. And while uh, we, I don't think we learned what we were hoping to learn about CBD and flow. We did learn, and it's really great proof that um, there is a direct correlation between social support, people who have social support, and high flow lifestyles. So you want, uh, you need the social support uh, during this period for uh, for sanity. But if you guys are going to drag each other down during that support, it's defeating the purpose of the support. <clears throat> Super. That's super helpful. So I just pulled uh, Dr. Chris on here. Chris just dropped a great comment saying that we should call it physical distancing, not social distancing, because social connection is still possible. So I want to pull Dr. Chris up. If you can introduce yourself, Chris, and then potentially just say a little more about that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that in a little more detail. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah, so hi, everybody. I'm Chris Bertram. I am a uh, professor up at the University of the Fraser Valley in the West Coast area of Canada. And uh, I also do a lot of work with um, Olympic athletes and professional athletes and um, a lot of other folks uh, through the Flow Research Collective, more sort of on the corporate and wellness side of things. And um, yeah, on that point, um, you know, I think it's a uh, the hashtag social distancing, I think, is I think getting a bit overblown. And I, I get what the point is. And I think we all get what the point is. But I think if we could just maybe realize that what we're talking about here is physical distance and we don't need to necessarily distance ourselves socially, although that is probably a really slippery slope. And I think it's just really important that we're really cognizant of the fact that in times like these that we are making points to reach out socially to friends and family and colleagues uh, to maintain those social connections lest we fall into the world of isolation and further down the rabbit holes of rumination and fear and doubt and anxiety so yeah i gotta back i gotta back that up if for those of you who know me you know that social isolation is my middle name <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, 
<laughs> that's how I roll. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, not, but not this time. You know what I mean? Like literally like two, three times a day, I'm, you know, just reaching out to people, seeing if they need anything, you know, just to, just to have contact. And that is, that's, if you know me, you know, that's really unlike me. Um, so yeah, I want to echo what Chris is saying and, and talk about, you know, just mention how important it is. Super. Got another good question here, folks, which I'll throw out to all of you. So which flow triggers are most effective and sustainable for keeping up optimism, hopes, and goals during this global crisis? So I'll let other people talk. Have a second. So you're, there's, there's something confused in that question. Optimism, hope, and goals for flow triggers are flow triggers are preconditions that lead to more flow. There's 22 different flow triggers. There's into 12 individual triggers which will drive me into flow or Connor into flow. There are group triggers, right? What will drive everybody in, on the screen into flow together. And by the way, you can have group flow at a distance, right? We could be doing improv comedy together through the screen and be in group flow together. You don't have to be in physical proximity to be in group flow together. Interpersonal flow, two people talking, right? We were, you know, a bunch of the coaches were, and, and myself were on the call at a time. We were laughing. We were in the moment. We were in interpersonal flow, right? You don't, you can do that through the screen. So, uh, for group flow. Uh, but my point was flow triggers drive are all, and they do this neurobiologically. We could talk about why, but they're all things that drive attention into the present moment. They, they drive norepinephrine or dopamine to focusing chemicals into your system. Um, not too much norepinephrine, by the way, but a lot more dopamine, um, or they lower cognitive load, which is the weight of all the crap you're trying to think about at once, or they do one or all three, right? This, when we talk about flow triggers, we're talking about things that do that. Flow, on the other hand, will make you more hopeful, more optimistic, and much, much more likely to accomplish your goals. So those are, uh, those are downstream effects. Um, and I also, um, I really want to stop for half a second and just talk about goals for a little while. We know setting a high, hard goal. So I am going to survive COVID-19 with my brain and my heart intact. That's a high, hard goal, right? That increases motivation 11 to 25%. So it's actually the power of cognitive reframing, right? The context we build around a thing. A goal is a very powerful way of cognitive reframing. By the way, so is gratitude. Um, these are all reframing techniques and reframing is very effective study out of Harvard where they uh, used a very funny, they took people who were physically afraid and they had them stand up and say, I am excited. I am excited. I am excited three times in a row a form of reframing. And it works because anxiety and excitement are the same signal. And they tested it against mindfulness meditation and they found it was a more effective way to lower anxiety so reframing is a good tool for you right now i have no idea how i got so sideways from where i started <laughs> to shut up now <laughs> okay I got, well either you guys want to ch chime in on that question i've got another one I'll, I'll chime in real quick rian okay. um, i think one of the, the answers to the question was actually in the question and that's what steven was just getting at there clear goals are a flow trigger like that's a really important thing just to know. I mean, you want to know what flow triggers will get you going, you know, starting your day by getting a list of like, have those high hard goals for sure. But, you know, starting your day with that list of things that you're going to knock off early in the day, that's so important. And it's so easy to overlook that one, make a list. And I mean, write it out. What do you want to get done in the next 90 minutes or 120 minutes? Write it out. Tick those things off. Give yourself that little reward of things are getting done. Otherwise, it's really easy to just let that norepinephrine drive your focus into Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Use it for good. Yeah, yeah, super important. So uh, keeping on the goals theme, another good question that I think is important to address is how should we think about adjusting goals during the crisis or abandoning goals and pursuing different goals? And just to quickly add on that one, Stephen and I were talking about even for our goals with the company and our growth and progression, that it's incredibly, incredibly important to not make this entire thing a self-fulfilling prophecy by assuming that everything is just derailed and you've instantly got to drop what you're aiming for or totally pivot. 
ideally just keep going after i think for a lot of people what you were originally going after unless for some reason that's literally impossible and avoid making it a self-fulfilling prophecy you end up undercutting yourself just based on an untested assumption so anyone else have anything else to chime in on that um yeah i mean i think that we all have to sort of reprioritize a little bit here i think that in times where there's a lot going on and we're processing a lot of things outside of our normal everyday life, we need to prioritize, you know, like we need to be looking after our homes and our families first, right? We got to make sure that everything's dialed in there. Once we have that, that reduces some of the cognitive load that Stephen was talking about. And then we can get back after some of our daily chores and work related chores and social connection and that sort of thing. So, reprioritizing a little bit now is really, really important around your goals. And if you can, if there are things right now that you can flush, flush them, right? What is important right now? What are the most important goals? Write them down, make a list, get after them. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So next one is any tips to help parents with young kids that are now at home? so that we can use these concepts to help children cope and adopt to this new reality so that they stay engaged in activities and avoid excessive TV or screen usage. So basically any tips to help parents with young kids who are at home now so that they can get in a flow themselves and not just be indoors watching TV all day. Yeah, I'll, I have two kids at home. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in on that one first. Shoot. Um, I think it's really important that we model appropriate behavior here. If you don't want your kids on screens all day long, don't. And that's something I have a real hard time with. I've been overdosing on Twitter and on news, trying to educate myself, trying to keep up to date with what's current. But I really have to just check myself sometimes and, and make sure that I'm aware of the fact that I'm being watched. and that is not necessarily where we need to be right now. There has to be that time, at least there does for me, but then I make a point of switching it off and being present and being super present and sitting down and asking them how they're feeling, what's going on, sitting down and playing with them for a little while, just getting into the moment with them and being present and leading by example is super important. Mm. Yeah, I mean, okay. I think all of this indecision just created a leadership vacuum in a very short period of time. And parents, more than anybody else, are going to be feeling that because there's a lot of confusion and the normal way that we have goal direction and leadership um, has suddenly changed. It suddenly shifted to a certain extent. Um, and just being mindful of that, that like it or not, I think we're all put into um, uh, leadership positions more so than we would be otherwise. Mm. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Everyone's kind of got to step up. So, but uh, really always, and it's always a great look. Creativity uh, is a flow trigger, which is to say, pattern recognition, the linking of ideas together is a flow trigger. You get a little bit of dopamine um, when that happens, and that can drive us towards flow. This is a phenomenal time for our projects, phenomenal time for creative skills. And one thing, to think about is, you know, those kind of craft skills, whether it's playing guitar, dancing, take your pick, um, especially if they're not directly tied to how you make a living, they're really high flow activities. And just to have one on the side that you can turn your attention to um, is, you know, really astounding. I, you know, I have a career because along the way i learned to turn fear into words essentially which is how i you know started my career and i was doing that long before it was paying any of my bills that was a skill that i had to learn along the way this is a phenomenal time to learn how to turn fear into art really good time and there's a lot there's a lot of flow there and especially for kids um but i'm going to shut up on that because if you know me you know i don't have any children and so I don't have any authority here. So I keep that uh, <laughs> All right. So kind of related to that, any advice for people at attempting to sustain and ideally even increase performance while working from home? <laughs> no, Chris, you want to take that? No. Um, I, yeah. Um, um, I don't know. I'm happy to take a first stab at it. 
Um, um, Cause I think, you know, um, being ultra sensitive to habit formation in this period of time. Um, and so operating with a high degree of resolve through that um, is how you're going to exit the situation in a much better state. Um, and then just really practically, we're all going to be a lot more sedentary. Um, and so like doubling down on um, exercise habits, especially is going to be incredibly important. And then going back to the question earlier about what flow triggers are more important. Um, so I, I would say an exercise habit, right? So an, an embodiment trigger, um, and then a little bit of novelty as well. Um, and so trying to be able to find novelty, however you find it best, you know, whether that's, you know, going for a walk and if that's, you know, available to you in the area that you are, um, in a novel environment, anything that you can do to kind of, you know, um, uh, disrupt that sedentariness. Um, and then also just being mindful of, you know, the fact that if we're stuck in one location for a period of time, um, we are, our day-to-day -day lives become a little bit more like a monotone. Um, and so trying to actively seek those um, opportunities to factor in or layer in a little bit more opportunity uh, or a little bit no uh, more novelty um, is going to, you know, really help drive us into flow a little bit more. I think I want to build that. I want to piggyback on something Connor said um, about exercise practices. So uh, one of the things that we talk about is developing. There's a, we're not going to really talk a lot about grit right now, but um just if you want to develop kind of hardcore grit skills what we always advise is because you're going to have in any life you're going to have stressed out days you're going to have days where you're tired you're going to have days where you're not going to really feel gritty have a minimal grit skill so for me it's 150 push-ups if i can't do anything else i do that um it takes three to five minutes or so six minutes um, and I will like, sometimes I'll do it right before I, I'm going to get into bed, which is not great for sleep. I admit, but I just want to one, it, it, it forces me to get a little bit of exercise during the day. It'll calm down my immune system, but it also has a little bit of grit. Like at a time when I really didn't feel like it, I still did this. So I think, you know, you want your bigger chunk exercises, but have a minimal grit skill just so you could have talked about the, the kind of the hit you get, the dopamine hit you get from accomplishing goals minimal grid exercise put it on your daily to-do list get it done each day throughout this period super <clears throat> so interesting one here how to think about our identity when the activities we've based our identity on we're currently unable to do basically so if, if i don't know you identify as a skier and now you can't go skiing or whatever it is how do you deal with that yeah, that, that's tricky, and that's something that I've dealt with um, with a lot of people in my social network, um, which is, you know, what happens, especially when an injury happens and suddenly you're locked out of your main flow activity. Um, and in order to really drill down on that as much as possible, you have to divorce the activity that you choose in order to find flow from flow as a state of consciousness, right? You can find flow in any number of different activities. Um, and so knowing that, you know, the way that you're used to finding flow, the way that you've built that, you know, flow identity for yourself um, is no longer um, available to you. Um, but just sitting there and be like, oh, this is just a state of consciousness that I can replicate in any number of different domains. And so find some sort of backup. Um, and when you find that backup, you have to pursue that with the same vigor that you um, pursue your main flow activity, whatever the case may be. And bear in mind that, you know, according to the challenge skill balance, we achieve more flow as we have higher and higher skill levels. And so we always want to balance the challenge that we have with our skill level. Um, but as we get to higher and higher skill levels, we access more flow. So there's going to be a lag period during which you have to be able to commit to that process. Um, and pursue that new flow activity with a comparable amount of vigor, um, but just maintain that confidence and that resolve that you will be able to tap into that same state because it's really just a state of consciousness independent of whatever activity you're in. Mm, yeah, super important. So we've got uh, Dr. Sarah Sarkis about to jump on now. Uh, and I got a question for her when she gets on. She's almost there. there Can we go. you hear me? <clears throat> yeah. Can hear you great, actually, Sarah. Uh, oh. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> so you're wearing your headset hi, again. Hi, Stephen. Hi, hey, Sarah. Sarah. Hi. So good to see you. So good so, to see you, as always. 
<laughs> so I got a question for you, Sarah. Uh, and if you can introduce yourself as well, please, before answering. But basically, people are wondering, what are the essential properties of connecting? So in other words, if we can get into flow without being in physical contact, and if we can still connect virtually, what actually is it that fosters connection if it's not just physical proximity? Maybe that's the group flow triggers. Well, I think, well, okay, so I'm supposed to introduce myself. I was going to get right to it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping the gun. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Sarkis, and I'm a, a licensed clinical psychologist. I have a private practice in Honolulu, Hawaii, and I'm also a consultant with a coach at the Flow Research Collective. Um, so thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, well, this is topical for our shrink wrap because it's coming up after, you know, at some other time when we return to regular scheduled programming, we'll have that whole blog on belonging um, and, or on connection. And the key thing is having a sense of belonging. That's really what is going to um, give us the sense of connection that we miss because of the physical isolation. So I saw on the comments, some people were writing in earlier things that they were doing. They were setting up ways to connect with people, whether it was like WhatsApp chats or um, Zoom calls. I know Dr. Barbara Elfried had a great idea with her kids. She's going to have to circle back around to that question. She set up like Zoom play dates to do board games. So I think that there's really a lot you can do in that regard. Um, if we remember that um, we don't want to let ice, we don't want to let physical isolation keep us from connecting with one another. That really deteriorates our thinking quite quickly. It's why we use solitary confinement as a tool of torture. So. Um, connect, connect, connect. That's why Stephen put this together so quickly, all so that we could connect with each other with a feeling of being, of belonging together as a collective. Mm, super. We got Brent on now as well. Dr. Brent, do you want to do a quick sign check? Oh, this is a tragedy. <laughs> Yeah, like Brent's at the back of a nightclub or something. There, it looks I like. I know he's in the back out somewhere. <laughs> oh, and he's pissed. <laughs> we love you, Brent. Oh, uh, it's a pity. Okay. Let, at we'll, some point, Brent, you might, you know, learn how to work a microphone with your PhD. But that day is not today. They didn't not, teach you know. that in our in our <laughs> curriculum. I know let's they did. Let's get Rachel on. I'm gonna pull Rachel in here. Uh, is Rachel on, Sarah? Do you know? No, I don't. I only see three of us. She's on the okay. call. She's on the call. She's, the... she's been in the waiting room, yeah, the whole time. Okay. Yeah. In the meantime, um, Sarah, could you talk a little bit to the matter of setting boundaries when working from home that we were all talking about yesterday in our call? Yeah. That's a key yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're sort of, uh, you were our inspiration. And I have to tell you, it went on to inspire lots of, um, changes in my own house. So one of the hardest things I think in terms of structuring yourself to work from home is the first critical thing is create a space. And I'm referencing this call that Rianne and myself and Dr. Barb and Alfred and Brent had um, the other day that will be released at some point. And Rianne actually set up a desk area in their like bathroom. Um, because he needed privacy. He needed to have walls. So that's just an example of turning an unconventional space into something that's really, really productive. And it gave you a physical space to go to. And the other thing that was mentioned um, that day that I think is critical is whatever your morning routine is, do it, but then shower and get dressed like you're going to work sit down at your desk, ready to look at your list of things to do for anybody that thinks we don't practice what we preach. Um, <laughs> get your list of things to do and have it, uh, you know, on your desk so that when you go to sit down and you're prepared to start as though it is a more typical work day, 
that's really, really beneficial. It goes a long way. Um, and, you know, rework your house in creative ways that you can to have each person have a little nook that they can sit at comfortably for stretches of time with, uh, you know, as little distractions as possible. So I want to... I want to emphasize something a little bit. Um, we always tell this to people as you're starting up any peak performance practice or any flow practice, have your conversations ahead of time. And what we mean by that is just tell people what you're trying to do. Hey, I am trying to isolate myself for X, Y, and Z, right? Have your conversations ahead of time. You want to do this, you know, companies, uh, you want to, you know, you don't want to suddenly start your day with 99 and 20 minutes of interim concentration without running it by the boss. We'll probably want to do the same thing in your homes, in your families. But, you know, the idea here is, hey, I'm preserving this time for me to do what I need so I can preserve this time later for you. Right. And there, there's a trade off here, but you want to have those conversations ahead of time. Super. OK, super helpful. So just before there's a little bit of drop off, understandably, with people. So I just want to make people aware of something that we're actually offering to all of you guys beforehand. And then we'll jump back into questions. So over the last six months, Steve and myself and our team of psychologists and neuroscientists have been building a new training, just coincidentally called Distraction Disruptor, which is specifically designed to show you how to avoid distraction. It gets super practical down to the level of the exact iPhone and MacBook settings you should use to optimize for flow. And we were planning on releasing that training in the last couple of weeks, and then it just completely coincidentally timed with COVID-19. So we've decided to make it all super accessible to all of you. It was originally going to be launched into the market at $1,000. And we've actually discounted it down to $95. It's a seven-week training, super practical, super helpful. And you can actually get access to that by clicking the button. There's a green button, Join Distraction Disruptor, now on the screen. And we're going to keep that $95 uh, price and that significant discount on for the next at least a few weeks while all of this hysteria is going on so that you've got uh, the ability to get in in an accessible way without going under financial duress or anything like that. So uh, anyone who's interested in that, feel free to click the button at the bottom of the screen, jump on board. We'd love to see you in there. Really confident it'll be super helpful. And just the last thing to mention on that is we've also added in two bonuses from Stephen that you guys can capitalize on there. So there's a long, really great interview with Stephen on the future is fast than you think and technological change and how to position yourself optimally given the technological change that's coming. But anyway, just wanted to throw that out there to anyone who might find it helpful. Join Distraction Disruptor now, the button's on the screen, and uh, yeah, $95 for any of you guys who would be interested. So um, next question I've got, Rachel, for you, which is again, something we were talking about yesterday, which was super interesting, was the idea of rather than just setting a to-do list, actually having a cognitive load list. We touched a little bit on that, with clear goals, but I think it'd be helpful if you could break that down for people again, Rachel, in terms of the necessity of that and how to actually set that up and do it. Please introduce yourself as well, Rachel. Hi, super nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you. Um, I'm Rachel Barbin Alfred. I'm a clinical psychologist. Also, um, I am uh, in just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and um, I work with individuals and families and executives um, around, you know, trying to be your best self. And I'm here with the Flow Research Collective and this is super fun. So, um, okay. So you were asking me about cognitive load. What, is there a specific question that you wanted me to address? Because I was yeah, actually I'm about something else that you had touched on because I, I really want to talk about the kid issue because I have three. And so I really Go think I'm the Go most um, <laughs> qualified to answer that question. Yeah, dive And in. you were a camp counselor. Don't give short shrill to that. that that's also true. I was, a, I was a camp counselor for many years. Um, so I think there are a couple of things that are really important to keep in mind. One is I think it's we all work really well when we have boundaries. And that is true for kids. And what is so frightening for most of us right now is that the boundaries that we normally have, the, you know, routines that we normally have, which school is a big one, right, have has just evaporated. So if you don't have online learning set up through your school system for your kids, set up a schedule. 
Mm. When breakfast is, when snacks are, uh, some of my friends are actually packing lunch for their kids so that, you know, it's not at lunchtime, then you're sort of swamped with like, uh, you know, because the first day we were home, it was like every 30 seconds, somebody wanted a snack and I was, you know, tearing my hair out. So now we have a really set schedule about when we're going to read, when we're going to play a game, when we're going to have um, what we're going to do. And I built into that the all the things that we're talking about here today. So we have to get outside. Today was pouring rain. We're here in Massachusetts, so that was harder. But we have to do physical activity. We have to spend some time in quiet reflection. You know, that has different meaning for my 10-year-old, my 8-year-old, and my 3-year-old. But they're all doing something involved in that. Um, and we're doing creative stuff. We're doing fun stuff. But the schedule is really, really important. Trying to create a boundary and trying to create a routine makes us all feel safer. Mm. Yeah, super um, helpful. <clears throat> so I think that that sort of leads into this question about cognitive load, right? If you're overwhelmed with trying to manage all of the news and all of the um, everything that's coming at you, you have less space to manage the other stuff in your life. And so you really have to pick and choose where you're pointing your attention. Hmm. I want to build on that a second and, and, and sort of tie in something uh, Dr. Chris said earlier, which is um, one of the reasons you want a clear goal list, one of the reasons you want a schedule and this is this is true in general. It's really too true in these times of crisis. Is if you cross everything off on your to do list, if you get through the entire schedule you set up with your family, you've won your day, right? We need to know how to declare victory over our day in general, right? Not a bad practice as you're falling asleep to think of three things, you know, three victories you had in in the day in general. Not a bad thing to do. Um, but you really got to know how to win your days, especially in time of, of crisis, right? It could be much diminished from how you would win your day normally, but you got to be able to declare victory. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to be filling out. Rhea and I were laughing ahead of time. I have tried because I'm home alone, of course, or not home alone, but, you know, home my wife and my dogs and nobody else. I've doubled down on my writing. And no matter what I do, I can only write 700 words a day. 700 words is how much I write normally, but I, I have doubled and tripled my writing period, and I'm still only writing 700 words because my productivity is diminished, right? Because for all the reasons Rachel just went through, there's a lot of more cognitive load. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's heavier. Productivity is down. So I've doubled down sort of on my time to get the same results. Um, so one, don't beat yourself up when you perform that way, really critical. And two, know how to declare victory over the day. Know how to say, okay, yeah, I kicked ass today. Great. Right. And that goes back to the, the gratitude piece, right? And that works really well with the kids too, right? Like I'm always, we got to practice this. What went well? How did it go? What are we grateful for? And it's part of the routine also. And there was a question I saw flying by on the chat about what happens if the kids or somebody else in your life doesn't want to engage in the routine. You have to get them involved in it, right? It's not the same for a three-year-old and a 15-year-old saying like, this is the schedule, but even explaining this is why we have a schedule because it's going to make us all feel better. Mm. It's an adult swaddle. Yeah. Schedule's <laughs> an adult swaddle. And the um, and maintaining that kind of structure for children, it provides containment. And containment is one of the very first things that we need to replicate when we're out of the womb. And that's why we swaddle children. It's for primary the primary layers of self regulation that we build. And um, it's really critical in times like this. And I think what Stephen was highlighting is something that at the Flow Research Collective, and certainly in, you know the work that I do privately that I'm always emphasizing, which is this is where you get to see how important cognitive flexibility is. So that capacity, when Stephen says to scale back winning the day, that's a form of cognitive flexibility. It's the opposite of being rigid. 
oh, well, everything's changed, so it means I'm not productive. You know, there may be days, like for Stephen, the win over the last two days was a 30-hour news moratorium. That's a huge win. But he may not have said that 14 days ago. He wouldn't have thought to have that kind of flexibility around what a, a win really does look like now. Um, so I, just, I think it's just integrated. <clears throat> That's, I think that ties also very much so into the question earlier about adjusting goals. I think it's important to adjust goals in that respect, but maybe not necessarily your high, hard, long goals. Um, yeah. So, and just to, just to tie a bow in the cognitive load thing, we had like seven people there asking what's the cognitive load list. Um, basically just the idea there is that rather than just having a to-do list for the sake of knowing that you're doing things, the to-do list should also be serving the function of a cognitive load list. So it's not just to remember to get stuff done, it's to get the stuff out of your mind to minimize the amount of information you're holding and working memory at any given time so you've got more cognitive resources available to focus on the things that are actually in front of you that you need to direct your attention to. Mm -hmm. So, all right, um, let me pull up another question here, folks. Anyone else have a topic they'd like to talk on just while I'm looking for another question? Um, I can talk a little bit about your question about connection before. Yeah, please. Go for it. Um, we feel connected to others when we feel seen. And so you can, you can tell when someone's actually paying attention to you, whether they're in the room with you, on the phone with you, or in a video chat. You know, when, when I say, oh, I'm feeling stressed and somebody goes off on their story, right, and doesn't actually listen to me, that's when we spiral. But when somebody can sit and say, yeah, I hear that, you know, and, and really respond to me and really make me feel that they are seeing me that's when we feel connected mm. i want to build on that a little bit so group flow shared flow where it could be four of us together it could be interpersonal flow one-on-one -on -one, has a bunch of different triggers as we said and and by the way this is all keith sawyer's work he's now at the university of north carolina he did all the foundational work on group work on group flow and if you don't know how he did it the story is kind of cool so Second City Television is the improv theater troupe that re feeds into Saturday Night Live. Keith sort of hung out with them for 15 years and filmed them. And group flow is really visible because if you're doing improv comedy, the group comes together, the team performs better, everybody starts laughing more. So you can measure audience laughter as sort of a, a way to judge group flow. And he was looking for the moments where everybody comes together, really starts clicking, and then he worked backwards to these triggers. The most important one is always say yes. It's an idea from improv. In improv, you always want to say yes. If you say, you know, somebody says, say, Stephen, there's a blue elephant in the bathroom. And I say, shut up. No, there's not. It's not very funny. If I say, I hope he's not using all the toilet paper. Now we've got a story. It builds on it. So the interesting thing about being stuck together, right, in close spaces is we tend and to get out of each other's... Stuck. Right. We tend to get on each other's nerves a lot more. And yes, and games are one. They're a very good way of seeing the other person. When we play yes, and games with other people, they feel very, very seen. It can defuse tense situations very, very quickly. And it's a really great <laughs> flow trigger. And somebody, uh, 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 oh, Michael Gog, they just, uh, dropped in an institutional yes. That's a reference to, so uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon decided it was so easy to say no to things and always say yes was such an important group flow trigger and group flow trigger was so important to productivity that they have an institutional yes policy. If you're a manager at Amazon and somebody comes to you with an idea, if you wanna say no, you can't, but you've got to write a two-page paper and post it on the company website as to why you're saying no. They have an institutional yes policy for, among other reasons, this very reason. Right, hmm. and I and that works with my in my work with kids, with families, with couples. One of the things I say to people because we get so caught up in being right, right, and this is the way we've got to do it, or this is the way I've got to do it. And if you can just love every idea for ten minutes say yes for 10 minutes before you come up with all the reasons for no, 
you're going to get a lot more buy-in from the people that you are stuck in close quarters with for a long time. <laughs> There's that word again. Yeah. <laughs> so got a question that we've been loosely touching on the whole time, but it's just interestingly worded. So I want to bring it back to this topic. So the question is when the human animal wakes up, the human spirit goes to sleep, meaning when shit goes sideways, the human animal takes over, the survival instincts drive people to stock up on toilet paper, et cetera. What tools can those of us who understand our biology and neurochemistry use to support those who are losing their shit and calm ourselves mm. down throughout? Mindfulness, mindfulness, mindfulness um, for calming ourselves down. And a lot of us touched on it earlier with up regulation and down regulation. And, you know, if people are super interested, I don't know if there's like a reason to do a spin off to get into like the nitty gritties of sort of these different practices. Um, but um, oh, Sarah, hold on. Let me just jump in for half a second. Um, yes. We are going to through the at the Flow Research Collective throughout the duration of uh, the pandemic. We are going to be do every Thursday. We're going to make this a regular, so we're going to be here with you every Thursday Thursday um, throughout this, and we will absolutely schedule Dial a, in. next week. Uh, Dr. Andrew Uberman, neuroscientist from Stanford. Um, some other people are going to be joining us. We're going to be going really deep on some neuroscience stuff. Um, but uh, weeks coming up, uh, we're also going to do one on exponential technology and flow in COVID-19. Uh, so we'll, uh, why do we do a nitty gritty of mindfulness? Because um, it'd be really useful. So yeah, because when you were going over, yeah, that's great. So because when you were going over some of the breathing techniques that you do, and I know that Brent, who unfortunately is having AV issues, um, <sighs> He's got a lot of um, stuff, you know, I think we all have the tools that we promote and, and use ourselves and it, it could be helpful. Um, but getting back to the other piece of that question about um, the like sort of having empathy, right? For other people and what's happening with other people. Um, there's also really interesting mindfulness practices around that kind of process of like trying to hold um, like a meta mindfulness process of trying to hold um, kind of people's well-being in your mind and your presence. And that makes a huge difference. Um, and be real, like we can't emphasize enough. First of all, this is what you've trained for. And so we, you've got the skills, it's just implementing them. Um, but we can't emphasize the, enough the importance of doubling down on your recovery processes. Mm -hmm. Sleep, water, movement, mindfulness, connecting to people. Notice how you feel when we get off from here, you're all gonna have a little bit more zhuzh in your step because that's the connecting the feeling like oh okay i'm not alone in it so uh just double down on all of those processes right now and to how do you of, spell zhuzh the judge that's going to be in my step i just carried <laughs> like how do i spell that like just I mean, in case like my wife asks hey what the hell is it i could be always oh, the judge in my step Bang. You and I both know I'm the last person to ask about spelling or yeah, grammar. You're right about that. You're right about that. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, if we think about really doubling down, as Sarah was saying, on our recovery, then we have more space to hold the people who are freaking out. And we know from attachment theory that, that, that just like anxiety is catching, so is calming. When, when you hold a baby who's freaking out and you are calm, they respond. So do we, so do adults, that we respond to other people's energy. And so if you want to be able to help people, others to calm down, whether it's people on your team or people in your community, doing all the things that you've been practicing to make sure that you are on, you know, your in your as best as possible space, that that's the best thing you can possibly do. 
sleep. While being trapped in your space. Yeah, meditation, whatever it is, <clears throat> mindfulness. Yeah, just, just to mention the simple point there that a lot of people get tripped up on is just simply that idea of feeling like they're being selfish by prioritizing their sleep, protecting their time, meditating, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas, you know, if you don't do that stuff, your, your capacity is just going to get entirely diminished. You're going to be useless basically to everyone else. So and your doing immune those system things. will be wrecked. Yeah. Right. Selfish, exactly. You know, so. judgment, right. Selfish is just a judgment. You have to put your oxygen mask on first. You have to take care of yourself if you have other people that you're trying to take care of or it will yeah. get old really fucking fast. Yeah. It's already. Totally. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. So we, we had a couple of quick questions about distraction disruptor there. I just want to address. So, uh, there is a community element of Distraction Disruptor. You'll get into Mighty Networks, which is our online platform. So it's a great way actually for everyone who's on the call now to be able to stay in touch and kind of engage in a community perspective as well. So if you're interested in that as well, feel free to jump on board there. Um, anyone else have any topics that you guys want to dive into or will I, will I pull up another question? We're actually, we're getting more just nice, satisfied, fun comments and questions. Right, so um, there's a bunch of people trying to spell zhuzh, Stephen. <laughs> You've started a craze. You've started a hashtag. Oh, God. Sure. There we go. Stacy. I like your spelling, I got to say. And Oz, <laughs> just because you're listening, I love you. Oh, Here's Oz. your hug, brother. There you go. Oh, there's your hug. Oh. Oz, I'm sure you've got some questions. You want to drop them in there? I see Mark Friedland in there as well. If he's got any questions yeah, or guys, shall. I just want to say I'm watching all this stuff um, and uh, I'm seeing a ton of names from all over the world uh, that people I, I know. Um, oh, shout out to so Paula good. in the Philippines too. Um, uh, just really great to see all you guys. Um, really glad we could come together and, and, and maybe restore a little bit of sanity in, in this moment. Totally. So hey, what we do, you want to do one more question? Fun. Yeah, Ryan, it's 5.30. Let's do one more question. Um, why don't you drop me in and bring Connor or Michael back in for five, ten minutes and okay. keep going a little bit for anybody who wants yeah. to stay, and then I'll come back totally. on. Great. All righty. But let's yeah. do a final question first, and then, then we'll do that. All right. I'm not going to drop. Well, you want to drop – you want me to drop you off? No, no, no. Well, drop me off in a couple of – I take the last question, then drop me off okay, for yeah, five thinking, minutes yeah, yeah, so I can okay. go to the bathroom, please. And then I'll bring somebody else on. No bathroom breaks for Stephen. Yeah, um, you know. So this one, this is just a simple one. Um, maybe potentially a little bit outside our scope, but I, I know that there's a few useful pieces of advice that we have here. Just hacks for a better immune system and anything on how flow can impact that, which you sort of touched on earlier anyway, Stephen. I so I want to I want to sort of reiterate um, what Connor said up front. We are not health experts. That's not you know, what we do. What I can tell you is the commonsensical stuff, which is first of all, flow massively lowers stress and pumps up the immune system. And that's that's a function of all the neurochemistry underneath flow. If you'd like to see the foundational science on it, take a look at Herb Benson, Harvard cardiologist book, The Breakout Principle. He's trying to rename flow the breakout principle at that point. So that's what he's actually talking about. You have to sort of get past that, but really well footnoted. Herb Benson sort of mapped the outline of the flow cycle, mapped a lot of the foundational neurobiology and did look at the health question a lot, goes deep on it. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to steer us around health advice, especially because I'm looking at the list of names who are on this chat. And there are so many people on this chat who actually know more about that than I do. We try to stay in our lane. So I'm, uh, yeah, but I will, that won't be our final question. Let's, let's jump to something else. Okay. So I, I got a kind of a random, but fun one here, which is just, um, what's a book each of you are reading right now during the pandemic? And I, I can start. I've actually got a good one for anyone who's got a business or is an entrepreneur. Um, so I'm reading a book at the moment, very aptly titled Only the Paranoid Survive by Andy Grove, who was the CEO of Intel. Phenomenal if anyone has a business or is in professional trouble in any respect. Definitely recommend you checking that one out. You want to dive in? 
Stephen? I'm reading one called The Trust Factor, which is really good. Um, I'm Paul's always act. in a... Yeah, exactly. I'm always in a perpetual state of reading, thinking fast and slow, literally. Um, <laughs> so, and I'm, uh, I'm determined to read a fiction <laughs> book during this. I am. This is uh, this is a, a new t a textbook. I got to get of science. It's the one that Maria Bannock and Rebecca Compton wrote. And the reason I'm holding it up, I. Uh, had never read it before. It's the first neuroscience textbook I've seen written by women, which is why it caught my attention um, so much. And I think it is the best, coolest, funnest book on cognitive neuroscience. So if you actually want to go deep and geeky, and yes, it's a textbook, but it's really phenomenal. And it's for neuroscience, it's incredibly readable. Um, so uh, that's what I'm reading. I'm actually reading two things. I'm reading the I'm rereading Difficult Conversations, um, which is by the Harvard Negotiation Project. They're just awesome. Um, and I am also rereading for the fifth time the fifth Harry Potter. <laughs> nice. Wow. Uh, Very synchron a lot of synchronicity there. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sure. throw one more question out, Stephen, then maybe we'll we'll drop off. Um and I'll be back. Is, I just have to go use the bathroom. Okay. 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 <laughs> you you, 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 you want to dive? Ahead, just go. No. No. <laughs> ask ask your question. Horse. Okay. Uh, if you want to take the first bit of this question, then uh, and then we can do the last bit to to Sarah and Rachel, which is basically just for those of us who have communities of people that are leaning on us for clarity and calm in times of uncertainty. What are some ways leaders can show up empathetically while serving our clients or those relying on us? Um, so Stephen, I don't know if you want to touch on empathy in any respect with regard to this question or leadership or the pandemic in general, and then Sarah and Rachel, maybe you can have a think about, uh, showing up with the leadership so, in general. I actually, I'm going to build on something Sarah said earlier on, on empathy. Um, first of all, the more afraid we get, the more selfish we get. That's just what happens, right? Um, it's a survival thing. The more fear, the more selfish. We want to protect the organism. We want to protect those closest to the organism kind of thing. Um, Sarah talked a little bit about loving kindness, compassion, meditation. So if you haven't read Altered Traits by Richie Davidson, uh, who's a, a neuropsychologist, uh, excuse me, a psychologist who studies neuroscience at the University of Wisconsin, he's been working with the Dalai Lama forever doing all kinds of brain imaging. Um, he wrote Altered Traits with Daniel Goldman. Phenomenal book about this work. Loving kindness meditation, uh, compassion meditation, um, which Sarah sort of outlined li loosely. 20 minutes a day massively expands empathy. And for leaders, if you're really trying to lead people right now, that's an important thing to know. For teachers and leaders, one thing I do want to mention, because this is a weird bit in the flow data, and you wouldn't know it was there unless, unless somebody pointed it out, and I'll explain why in half a second, but there is one thing, while flow is very contagious, um, works like any other emotion, it can be contagious, and there's brain rave entrainment, and there is there are really uh, good studies that say good leaders in flow will put their team in flow. There's a counter to that. Bad leaders in flow will not put their team in flow. What I mean by that is this is a study that comes out of education, but there was a bunch of studies done in education that said one of the things that can happen in the classroom very frequently, teachers in flow, students are not. Students are in flow, teachers not. And the reason is, as Connor mentioned earlier, flow happens when we're pushing on our skills, right? We're using our skills to the utmost. So teachers in flow, when they are pontificating and pushing on their knowledge and really talking about the stuff that's cool and exciting to them and what happens, students are lost. So one of the things to do is if you're leading people and you're feeling like you're really in flow, sort of check yourself a little bit and see, are people coming along for the ride? Because it is really easy to get on a high horse on a soapbox, feel the dopamine that you get from that and think you're connecting. And what you're actually doing is the exact opposite of what you want to be doing. So that's kind of worth knowing. And that's, uh, with that, I'm going to jump off and use the facilities, and I'll be back in five. Bring, in, bring Michael or Connor back. Michael's dropped off, but uh, one of you guys want to answer that question, and then we'll, and then we'll 
pull Connor back in if he's still here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. Um, and it's probably, there's, you know, certainly not been a time in my life other than maybe 9-11 where really strong but um, empathic leadership is needed because there are people whose lives are going, all of our lives are being turned upside down. And some people's lives are gonna be, you know, financially turned upside down, medically turned upside down. And um, first of all, I would say, if you're a leader and of an organization and you feel as though you're in over your head, there's people like us who do this work. And all day long, we work with executives to help them find their leadership style you're probably not gonna be able to build it during this time. You've gotta access what you've already put down, all the work that you've done to build strong management, have direct communication, have all the underlying um, threads that contribute to this thing we call great leadership. And one of the things I think that can be really valuable right now is to just set up an opportunity to listen to people. Just listen to where they're at and what they're, what are the managers of your departments worried about? What are they facing from what are the kinds of questions they're facing? And then you can start to try to get a, a systematic view of what the whole organization needs um but you've got to start now because people really need to feel as though they have a solid ground during this period of time and your leadership is the way that that's going to happen and there's tons of things you can do when you're adapting distance working which is where most of us are probably going to head um to really start to play with these uh, motivation, discipline, structure, um, but it takes expertise. So reach out to people. If you don't have a coach at this point and you're a leader, you know, contemplate it. That would be my advice. So That's super helpful. Um, I think. Sorry, Rachel. Just before, just before you jump in, Michael's got to jump in a sec, but he's got a, a point there just to make before he before he goes, and then we'll we'll go back to you, Rachel, afterwards. Real quick, I'm reading The Neuro Generation by Tan Lee. Awesome. The new era of brain enhancement that is revolutionizing the way we think, work, and heal. And then I'm also rereading a great book, which I highly recommend to everybody, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind mm. by Shunru Suzuki, who brought Zen Buddhism to the West. Um, just wanted to make one real quick point about what Stephen was talking about, those questions earlier about uh, the immune system. So I, I just recently read a study last week that was published, I think, in 2020. Um, first of all, we know chronic stress actually negative, negatively impacts the immune system and things like memory. Uh, but a study just came out from Penn State by um, her, uh, Jennifer Graham Engeland, uh, negative and positive affect as predictors of inflammation. And the study found basically that negative moods may change the way in which the immune system responds and increases inflammation and cytokine release and things like that. So individuals who experience negative moods um, several times per day for extended periods tended to have higher levels of inflammation biomarkers in their blood. And not only that, but that right after the negative moods, or they measured the, the, uh, the blood soon after the, uh, the negative moods, they were higher, and then they decided to taper off. Um, and experiencing positive moods, even for a short while before the collection of the blood sample, that was associated with lower inflammation levels. Um, and that, and the study actually mentions that was true for males only. So um, fascinating, fascinating research there about, uh, about the relationship between the immune system, inflammation, and um, affect or emotion. And so uh, there's, a, there's a correlation there and probably has something to do with vagal tone and the vagus nerve and heart rate variability. So mm -hmm. I'll just say that. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Super interesting. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having the Michael today. All the best. Thank you. Everybody. Oops, cut him off. <laughs> Rian, you in, I have, well, I actually have right. to run. I don't, I okay. want to leave you, but I have to go drive my son to soccer practice. So. Okay. Oh, you guys <laughs> All the best. Wow.
Thank yeah, you so yeah. much. Well, it's an individual session. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for arranging this and Great having all this. And sir. thank you, everybody, for coming and spending time with us. We'll do Thanks, more Sarah. of it. Thanks okay, do I just hang up and nothing will happen? Uh, I'll drop you off. There you go. Right, so you want to jump in with the point you were going to make there while I pull the, pull the guys back on? Um, yeah, so in terms of leadership, this is a super, super complicated time because a lot of the things that we, at least one of the things, I've been talking with a lot of my, you know, um, like folks who are running big organizations, executives, one of the things that they have to do is they have to be attached to the news. They have to know what's going on. And so there is a really, it's a, it's a big push pull between how do you take care of your team and take care of yourself. Um, but I do, and I do think what Sarah was saying about, you know, talking to someone um, is really important. And I do think that the same stuff that we've been saying today is, true for leaders you have to sh if you're talking about empathy you have to show up as yourself and you have to acknowledge that these are uncharted times right there's 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 nothing in the rule book there's nothing in your mba there's nothing that you've read that like has prepared you to figure out how to create a culture of working from home if you haven't done that already there are things you can start to do now but you have to acknowledge that this is all uncharted and we're in it together. And if you can actually sit with that and acknowledge it yourself, you're much more likely to be able to get it back from others and have others really, you know, feel that they are being heard. Super, super helpful. So nice I also Rachel. have to jump. All right, Rachel, Rachel thanks again. Thank you for your time today. Thank I appreciate you. your insights. Thanks, nice, Rachel. Always. All the best. Bye-bye. All right, gents, any, any final points you guys want to wrap with or touch on? I've got a couple of bits of housekeeping to wrap with, but. Yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, I'd love to wrap up just by uh, perhaps addressing the leadership question as well. Um, and so I think anybody who's been involved in any sort of high performance lifestyle is effectively practicing one skill over and over and over again. And that's maintaining your integrity in the face of adversity. Um, and so anybody who has a higher degree of goal orientation, and I think that every single person who's part of uh, this call, um, they're just exercising that muscle day after day after day. And so things are fundamentally the same today as they were a few weeks ago. It's just the stakes are a little bit higher. And so the game remains the same that it always was, which is maintaining integrity in the face of adversity. It's just the stakes of that adversity went up a little bit. You know, maybe we, we subjectively feel that we came down a level or two, a rung or two on psycho, uh, Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, but effectively the game is still exactly the same. Um, and so I think part of leadership and part of, um, you know, what we're all dealing with now on a day-to-day -day basis is really just that one fundamental task. Super. <clears throat> no, it's helpful, Connor. Thanks for that. Um, Ethan, Stephen, you want to mention? Or we, we yeah, start I, just, I just want to wrap up with, I just want to reemphasize something I think everybody talked about, which this is a time to be really kind to yourself. Kind to other people, kind to yourself. Um, and when I say that, what I'm really talking about is how we're thinking. And, you know, somebody in the comments earlier, you know, asked a question about how do you stop the kind of negative daydreaming? And guess what? You actually just stop. You have to physically sort of change the way you're thinking, choose to think about different things. I always say in times of crisis, heartbreak, any of those things. Um, for me, cheap detective novels and spy fiction have a distraction <laughs> that will cut through everything, right? Whatever it is, find yourself a distraction, something that can actually, you can really, really sort of use because there's going to be times when you can't do, when anything you're trying to do is going to spiral negative, find something that will work sort of no matter what. For me, it's um, detective fiction. If that doesn't work, I will watch ski videos. Um, those are like, that's what I can do to make myself feel better when everything else is failing. So be kind to yourself, figure out what those things are, figure out what they are for your friends, your family, make the time a little bit for that. And just know guys, we are like it or not all in this together. So we're going to be there for you. 
hopefully you guys can be there for us and uh we're gonna get through this together Reed, i'm gonna kick it back to you cool so just to wrap up folks um as steven said we're gonna be doing this the same time every week with rotating different guests so next week we've got we've got dr andrew huberman and um, we're gonna be diving deep diving deep into stress and fear Stephen mainly the neuroscience of stress and fear uh, a lot of you guys have been asking in the comments as well about how to work with us and coaching and things like that again your best bet at the moment is to take advantage of the big distraction disruptor discount really really confident you'll love it and as i said there's a community group and everything in there it's perfect for right now really really confident you'll get a ton out of it so i encourage you to join distraction disruptor otherwise if you want to dive deeper with us and learn how to thrive during the chaos overwhelm and uncertainty the other option is to go to zero to dangerous.com zero to dangerous.com and you can book a free consult with us there's an application there just to do a little bit of screening to make sure it's a good fit but zero to dangerous.com and you can do a call with us there to assess whether zero to dangerous is a good fit and for everyone on this call we're also offering a 500 dollars discount as well for zero to dangerous so just put crowdcast at the bottom of your application and you'll be able to get that as well um and then otherwise we're going to be putting out more free material obviously on social our newsletter as well we've got some good content already queued there for monday we're going to be doing a broadcast with a number of different uh, business experts specifically for all of the people in the collective who are entrepreneurs and who have businesses as well to give some really helpful advice in that respect as well not coming from us but coming from people who we trust in that space so that should be really useful to folks. So just stay plugged into all the different channels and we'll keep doing our best to help you all out as much as possible. And uh, yeah, until next week, I think that's about it. What is a final shout out to Claire in the background. <laughs> yeah, Rob, big thanks to Claire you. for Thank you, Claire. <laughs> holding everything together there. <laughs> and a big shout out to Connor and Rian and everybody else on the, on the Flow Research Collective team. Thank you guys for joining us. Good luck this week, and we'll see you next Thursday. Cheers, Thanks, guys. guys. All the best. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.